This month on 219 West, The Last Loaf. The Wonder Bread Bakery closes in Queens and 200 jobs head out of state. What kind of future is there for displaced workers? It's just a shock that it was that the place was closed and we didn't think it was going to close. Paris, London, the Bronx? What's wrong with this picture? We'll take a look at how the often slurred borough is trying to attract more visitors and help a failing job market. We're looking to get a four or five star hotel. Uh, we're the only borough without one. And we believe that that not only provides temporary jobs to build a hotel, but permanent jobs there. Plus, they come for the show, not the sermon. Picture taking tourists, many from Europe, often pack this historic African American church for Sunday services. But some churchgoers aren't happy. They want to do their own thing and it's not nice. They got to respect the church. It's not a dance hall. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of 219 West, the monthly news magazine produced by students of the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism for CUNY TV. I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. And I'm Mike Drury. We'll have those stories coming up and later on a Romanian man's American dream. But first, I took a look at the loss in manufacturing jobs in New York. For generations, if you walk down 170th Street in Jamaica, Queens, you'd smell fresh bread. Wonder Bread, one of the nation's best-known brands, was baking there. Just a few days ago, the factory baked its last loaf. This factory has been baking bread for a century and a half, supplying bustling markets in New York City and across the tri-state area. But three months ago, the management informed workers the ovens would be shutting down. Wonder Bread is not the only food producer to have left the city recently. Last year, Stella Doro closed its factory in the Bronx after 77 years. And in the spring, Sabra Foods, which makes Mediterranean dips, left Long Island City. They're just the latest examples of homegrown manufacturers leaving the city and taking jobs with them. Uh, where did I work before this? I worked for the uh, Postal Project. This was a better job, better benefits, union shop, much better. 63-year-old Freddie Wolf works with the giant ovens inside the factory. He's preparing to retire when the bakery finally powers down for good. Well, is okay. I have no problem. I have no problem. You know, they came and let us know what, we, what was going on, and uh, they kept us informed best they could. But it's just a shock that it was that the place was closed, and we didn't think it was going to close. But not all of the 200-plus employees losing their jobs feel that Hostess Brands, the parent company for Wonder Bread, has managed the 150-year-old factory responsibly. Gary Roberts, 59 years old, has driven a trailer for the company for the last 13 years. He believes it didn't have to end this way. It's been a very good job, good benefits, good pay, and we've become a family here. I believe management caused it by not maintaining this bakery for the last 20, 30 years. Um, we pretty much work with what we've got. We, we still put out a quality product. They should have been modernizing this place for a long time. That's their primary, primary excuse for closing down. It costs too much to modernize this facility. But uh, when the modern facilities break down, we're the ones who make the bread for the modern facilities. A hostess spokesperson did not return calls for comment, but the company has had a somewhat troubled history. In 2004, the company was forced to declare Chapter 11. The bankruptcy lasted for almost five years and included heavy concessions from labor unions and a rescue by New York leveraged buyout firm Ripplewood Holdings, which gained a 50% ownership stake. Since the bankruptcy, Hostess has closed nine of its 54 bakeries and laid off more than a third of its workforce. However, New York economic writer and professor Greg David says corporate bumbling is not necessarily the heart of the problem. He says the environment of New York City itself creates problems for modern manufacturing, and a more efficient company probably would have closed the factory even sooner. To run an efficient modern factory, you need one floor. To have one floor, you need land. You have to spread it out. You have to be able to get trucks in and out quickly. Crowded roads are not good for this. Land costs are high in New York. Taxes are extraordinarily high in New York. And because of the labor force, even if you're not unionized, labor force is, uh, is pretty expensive, too. The city has been losing manufacturing jobs since the mid-1960s, when there were more than 950,000. Today, there are fewer than 80,000. 
Lakshman Achithan, an economist who measures business cycles, says that the problem is not confined to New York, however. He says that factory jobs eliminated throughout the country in the Great Recession are probably gone forever, no matter how well the economy does or how much the country produces and exports. To be clear, the U.S. is still the biggest manufacturer in the world. Okay? We just do it with robots. <laughs> so we're outputting a lot of stuff. We're incredibly productive. What this means is you can fire uh, uh, 7 million people and still have roughly the same GDP. And that's what we've done. That's what's happened over the last two years. Huge productivity gains, very profitable for big companies. Shareholders make a lot of money. Uh, but there's 7 million people who are displaced, right? They're not working. Uh, they're on unemployment insurance. They have to retrain, get into another sector that is growing. Because he's retiring, Freddie Wolf won't have to retrain. He's philosophical about the loss of the factory, but worries about the nearby Jamaica community. Well, I feel kind of bad I'm losing my, you know, I'm losing my job, but on the same hand, I can retire now. Yes, I live in the neighborhood. Well, it's most likely would affect it because of the job losses and stuff. But uh, other than that, most of my co-workers, they live in the neighborhood. And we can't afford to lose no jobs. I can't retire. I have two young children at home. Jack Friedman runs the local Chamber of Commerce. He thinks the Wonder Bread factory building might be used as part of a plan to turn Jamaica into a dining and lodging destination for airline workers and travelers from nearby JFK Airport. I think that this won't help the Jamaica area in terms of employing um, their community workers, which in many cases are immigrant, immigrant workers, African American, Latino, um, middle class, but you know not not the same you know type of population as you might find in Manhattan. Uh, it's a real family area, and I think that families are going to get affected. As for workers hoping to hold on to union pay scale and benefits, those able to move to Philadelphia or Biddeford, Maine, may be able to follow the company there. In the meantime, they show up for work until the factory's final days in January. For 219 West, I'm Mike Drury. Imagine calling a house home for almost half your life, only to live with the uncertainty of whether it will still be home tomorrow. That's what one Queens man is dealing with every day. Our reporter, Walter Smith Randolph, spoke to him about his trying times. Stanley Theodore lives in this three-bedroom, two-bathroom home in Southeast Queens. He's lived there for over 30 years. All I want to do right now is save my home for me and my children. This is all I want to do. He lives in a home with his four children and three grandchildren but he sleeps on his couch because he doesn't know when he'll be evicted from his home. He signed over his home after he fell behind on his payments while being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder. No, yeah, that's me there in the middle. Okay. His home is now in foreclosure, and he can be evicted at any time. Three months, which was January, February, March. And when I sent in the payment, and I have all my receipts right there, I sent it in with uh, uh, approximate uh, interest, and they sent it back to me. And they sent it back and told me I, I, I was into foreclosure and they didn't want to hear anything else. And that's when I was seeking help. I just made 62 years old last Monday. I don't think I'm going to make 63 because I'm also, I have to stop. Do the right thing, it's like I'm doing well. I'm trying to save my children, I'm a single dad. It's like, I'm doing well. Stanley was caught up in a mortgage scam. He signed away his home, thinking that the company, Foreclosure Escapes, would help him save his home. Instead, they took out a loan in his name and made away with the profit. Those are my signatures. I didn't know what I was getting into. Theodore reached out to Neighborhood Housing Services of Jamaica, a HUD-certified organization that helps Southeast Queens residents with home ownership. They say they see a lot of predatory lending and mortgage scams. 
One thing that we're seeing now is unfortunately is um, mortgage scams, credit, you know, um, modification scams. Um, there are agencies that, you know, a lot of people out there are paying for modifications and they're not supposed to pay for modifications. Dislow says that her organization is in the heart of the foreclosure crisis. You know, right here at Jamaica Queens is the center. So, I mean, we see a lot. I mean, last last year we saw over a thousand clients, you know, counseling. And a lot of people wondering, where are you getting all these people? That we are at the center of the storm. There's a lot of there's a lot of residents here in Queens that are facing foreclosure. Southeast Queens has been plagued with foreclosures. It has been called the foreclosure capital of New York City. In 2009, the area had over 6,000 homes enter the foreclosure process. In comparison, Manhattan had 724 into the process. The Bronx ended 2009 with 1,962 homes in foreclosure. The closest boroughs to Queens high rate is Brooklyn with 1,984 and Staten Island with just over 2,000. Disla says that foreclosures have slowed down. In 1993, 9% of New York City homes that were purchased were foreclosed on. That number skyrocketed to 30% in 2007 and dropped dramatically to 12% in 2009. Foreclosure counselors at NHS of Jamaica say that they have seen this change because fewer people are coming to their offices concerned about their homes being foreclosed on. For now, Stanley Deodore gets to stay in his home while his foreclosure counselor works out a deal with the mortgage lender. For 219 West, I'm Walter Smith Randolph. 2010 has been a hard year. While the economy has improved, some New Yorkers still face the loss of jobs and homes. Is 2011 likely to bring better times? Greg David is a journalist, professor, and author who covers the city's economy. Greg, thanks for talking with us today. My pleasure. So, uh, New York's economy tends to differ a little bit from that of the rest of the country. Why is that? Well, I think it differs a lot, and I'm basically, I think most economists get it wrong. They say New York goes into recessions later, comes out later. You know, I've actually been back through all the post-war recessions. The New York City economy has very little to do with the national economy. Um, we're either much worse or much better off than the nation. Why? Because we're driven by Wall Street, frankly. It is our number one industry. It has dictated what has happened in the economy. And that's why you were just wrong in your intro, I'm sorry to say. This was a very good year in New York, a spectacular year economically, and especially when compared with the rest of the country. Um, is that throughout the boroughs? Yes, and that's another myth perpetrated by too many journalists, that it's only happening in Manhattan. Uh, there's been strong job growth in Brooklyn and other places. Look, the numbers go like this. We lost um, fewer jobs on a percentage basis than the country in the downturn. The recession here was half the length of the recession in the rest of the country. We've already gained back at least a third and maybe as many as half of the jobs we lost in the recession. And we haven't gained those jobs back in Wall Street, by the way. We've gained them back across all, virtually all other sectors. This year could rank as one of the best job growth years for New York in history. And I think that's why people have completely misunderstood what's happening in the economy. So, and, and is that likely to continue into 2011? Well, that's a very interesting question, and the answer is, um, at best, we'll repeat this year, but that would be great. And yes, we might see slower growth, and we might see, see slower growth, because we had such robust growth this year. I mean, we could have added 80,000, we may have added 80,000 jobs this year on the top end, as, as the low end's going to be at least 60,000. Wow. So. Um, there's been a lot of speculation. I mean, with the record of with with the record of an improving economy, uh, there's been a lot of speculation about Mayor Bloomberg and uh, the presidency. Do you think he'd make a good candidate or a good president? Uh, well, I have no clue whether he'd make a good president or not. I do know that uh, he took credit, right, that for he can weigh in on the nation because the New York City economy's done well. Well, you know, in my class, the first question on the exam on the first day is how much of a role does city government have in the economy? A lot, some, none at all. The answer's some. The mayor gets only some credit for what has happened uh, this year. Well, there it is. Thanks so much for coming by, um, and we hope you come by again sometime. I certainly will. Thank you. Melissa. Coming up, we take a look into one man's shot at the American dream. Ovidio Kalia was born in Romania, 
but now considers his life here the fulfillment of the American dream. Through his art, he has created a physical symbol of this ideal. Donna Rappaport met up with this unique immigrant. It's not every day that you get to meet a manifestation of the American dream. But if you stop by this small factory in Long Island City, Queens, you might just have a chance to see one in action. Meet Ovidio Colia, a 71-year-old Romanian immigrant, the sculptor and owner of Colbar Art. As a child in the communist regime, he heard about the Statue of Liberty on Voice of America radio. And when he managed to escape in 1978, he got to meet his childhood memory in real life. When I came to United States, uh, that was the first thing I saw from the airplane. I saw the Statue of Liberty, which I make the connection with the time when I was young and find myself in the situation to see it. But he didn't only see it. A few years later, he bought the factory he worked in and won the Ellis Island Foundation competition to make the official replicas of the Liberty statues for its centennial celebration. Soon, he became the largest manufacturer of the Statue of Liberty models in the world. But since 9-11, business has been down. Colia and his employees, all immigrants too, have been together for years, and Colia is doing everything he can to keep it this way. Salary, basic, we don't take the salary to save the business because it's very hard to lay off somebody who work with you, not for, with, uh, 20 years. Colia's plea is not uncommon. Many American businesses are reeling from the impact of China's economic engine, now the second largest in the world. In fact, China and other Asian economies are manufacturing more than 80% of all Statue of Liberties now being produced. You go from day to day, you go from month to month. I hope I will not be, I will not be forced to close down, but uh, it is on the table. Everybody helped the banks, the stock market, they helped everybody. A small business, nobody helped them. At tourist shops all over Times Square, most of what you see, from toys to electronics to apparel, is made overseas. And it's increasingly hard to find a Made in the USA sticker, even on the Statue of Liberty on sale. Miss Liberty is not Colia's only work. Colba molds, casts, and paints other American icons, as well as original art. Still, the experience of seeing the symbol of freedom from close up is what keeps him going. It's something you cannot describe. You have to feel it. You have to be there to see it. The other way, there are not words to describe that. So Kalia and his wife, along with 22 workers, and not one bit of pessimism, are pressing on. He fights to keep jobs at home, to give back to the country that gave him freedom, and keep the American dream alive. His current dream is to keep producing over 200,000 new green and golden souvenirs every year, made in Queens by a Romanian immigrant and 100% American. For 219 West, I am Dana Rappaport. Years ago, the Bronx attracted presidents, politicians, and pinstripe heroes. For years, the borough was forgotten. Now, Amy Yency takes a look at its glory days and how the Bronx is hoping to reclaim them. Irma Algorin lives in the Concourse Plaza building. It provides seniors with affordable housing. The building has been through many incarnations, a residence for welfare recipients, a probation office. But she remembers when it used to be a hotel and a grand one at that. We had beautiful dinners. We had beautiful relaxation amongst workers and friends. And then we were able to have beautiful dances by which we enjoy each other's company. And we didn't have to go anywhere else. The Concourse Plaza Hotel opened in October 1923, just in time for the first World Series at Yankee Stadium. It reaffirmed the Grand Concourse as the most elegant boulevard in the Bronx. People like uh, Franklin Roosevelt and Harry Truman and uh, John F. Kennedy all came to speak at uh, functions at the Concourse Plaza Hotel. The New York Yankees actually uh, uh, rented out a suite of rooms uh, so that the members of the team could live there. 
and uh, even as late as the uh, the 1950s, uh, Whitey Ford and Mickey Mantle uh, had rooms in the Concourse Plaza Hotel. The hotel's glory days came to an end during the 1970s. The city's economy nearly collapsed. The tourism industry in the Bronx did. Now, politicians hope to again attract tourists and jobs to the borough with the city's highest unemployment rate. We're looking to get a four or five star hotel. Uh, we're the only borough without one. And we believe that that not only provides temporary jobs to build a hotel, but permanent jobs there. And it creates a tourist economy where folks can now come and go to a Yankee game, stay overnight, and then go to the beach the next day when the weather's warm, or go to one of our beautiful golf courses. A full service hotel might also lure tourists to places like the Bronx Zoo and the Botanical Gardens already popular destinations for New Yorkers. One of the things we've experienced is that people are coming to the Bronx and it's like a hit and run. You come for one venue or to one institution and then you leave. We want to keep folks here. Some say the city has not done enough to help the Bronx rebuild. Tourism has helped the rest of the city weather the current recession. I would like to see the city set aside some funds so that it could, in a sense, sprinkle uh, some resources into an area specifically because it's a tourism zone, specifically because it re requires a little bit more care in terms of sanitation. And be more inclusive, promoting all five boroughs. Not just put them, you know, just a handful of things uh, at the end of a brochure, which is all about Manhattan. <laughs> The Bronx has neighborhoods known for their cuisine, like City Island and Little Italy, but it's still the only borough without its own restaurant week. Some suggest the business community hold events like that or build on the reputations of other famous Bronx attractions. I think this is a marvelous a spot to see a branch of the Baseball Hall of Fame. But the borough's reputation may be keeping people from spending time there. The word Bronx elicits in a lot of people uh, a negative reaction. During the 1970s, some landlords cashed in on their insurance policies by setting their properties on fire. They saw arson as a means to make up for low rents and the high cost of their real estate investments. The fires destroyed more than the buildings. They left the borough's reputation in the dust, along with the ashes and rubble. It looked like bombed out Berlin at the end of World War II. In October of 1977, the New York Yankees were the hosts of the World Series. And Howard Cosell uh, was one of the broadcasters. And you had the Goodyear blimp overlooking Yankee Stadium. Suddenly, you see a tongue of flame leaping up from a building, licking the sky enlightening the whole area, and it was a building that was on fire. And Howard Cosell, in his inimitable way, said, uh, uh, this is the kind of thing that Jimmy Carter saw when he was in the Bronx. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bronx is burning. Back at the Concourse Plaza, seniors say it's memories of the once grand hotel that keep old patrons coming back. Sometimes couples come by who, like, met in the ballroom. They were at a doo-wop, you know, party or something, you know and they're living out in Iowa or someplace. They have hope that eventually the Bronx will also make a comeback. For 219 West, I'm Amy Yancey. On any given Sunday, Harlem's historic black churches are filled, but not just with locals. These days, visitors from around the world are packing the pews. But as Alva French reports, some longtime churchgoers have mixed feelings about it. Sunday church services in Harlem are fast becoming a go-to destination for mostly European tourists. I, as an Italian, I really have um, a Catholic culture, but I, I really like the way and the happiness they transmit. And while many Harlem churches are well known and widely advertised, tourists are now discovering houses of worship that are off the beaten track, like Mother AME Zion. I 
I uh, listen to many, many church uh, in this area for gospel church, but uh, I said this is a little, it's not many frequently of uh, tourists. The oldest black church in New York State, Mother AME Zion Church, was nicknamed the Freedom Church for its role as a beacon of the Underground Railroad. But how does this church maintain its historic identity when many of the churchgoers don't even speak the language? I have a thousand uh, tourists here, or 1,500, or three. If I touch one, I was able to help them through some uh, difficult period, I give them strength to go back home, you know, those kind of things. That's more important than anything else. But the church tours are big business for some. The so-called gospel circuit that has sprung up includes about 20% of Harlem's almost 400 churches. Companies like Expedia, City Sites, and Grayline offer tours from $39 to over $100 for a free Sunday church service in Upper Manhattan. And it can be lucrative for the churches as well. Slate magazine recently reported that one church received as much as $3 per visitor from a local tour agency. Mother AME Zion Church pastor, Dr. Gregory Robeson Smith, nephew of legendary civil rights activist Paul Robeson, proudly refuses to work with these groups. We would never do that. Uh, so the people that you see here come because they want to be here. Maybe so, but some tourists break out their cameras and seem almost disinterested to the point where they get up and leave in the middle of a service. Uh, some of them is rude and some is not. They don't like to go by the rules that we tell them to do. They want to do their own thing and it's not nice. They got to respect the church. It's not a dance hall. We try to um, be as hospitable as we can, but we also want the people to be respectful, just the same way if they were in the cathedral of Notre Dame. Nationwide, church worship is on the decline, and some feel this is also fueling the death of the black church, a key component in America's civil rights legacy. Our membership has fallen off a lot because the elder people have died out, and the young people don't come to church anymore. They don't think they want to get out of hip hop and all that junk that they do out there. It's God dead, then the church is not dead. With gentrification in Harlem on the rise, European and Asian tourists often greatly outnumber the black local congregants on Sunday, historically the most segregated day of the week. So if today in post-racial America, there happen to be more Europeans than before, is it really a problem? because of such things as segregated Sabbath. We were not allowed to commune uh, with our white counterparts. So why are we so perplexed now that we've come from that, uh, from that point of view that we want to have reverse segregation? It's a marvelous thing we all mixing together because God said we all all are one, we all his children, so we all should be together. I think it's a beautiful thing for them to come from all over different countries to be here with us on Sundays. And that, say some parishioners, is priceless. For 219 West, I'm Alva French. That's it for this month's edition of 219 West from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism. Thank you for watching. I'm Mike Drury. And I'm Melissa Rose Cooper. We'll be back next month with more stories from the five boroughs. In the meantime, don't forget to check out our podcast on iTunes. From all of us at 219 West, take care.